I wish I had one of these when I go diving. You will never ever go into an overhead environment without a guideline the way Stan is doing because, well, it's very dangerous. You will get lost and you'll die. You will be breathing Trimix and his voice will be like, Helium voice. It will sound like, you know, like a chipmunk or whatever. Hello and welcome to Experts React. My name is Gus and I will be reacting to today's gameplay from Under the Waves. I am an underwater cave explorer and cave diver and I can't wait to see what the game looks like. I like that saying. Why, if I'd known the big man himself was running my orientation. How you doing, old man? Looks like Stan is a commercial diver. And so he's on this bell that basically lowers the divers all the way to the depth where they're going to be working at. And what happens is this bell is pressurized to the pressure where they're going to be working at. So he's getting ready for the dive. Now, typically there's more than one person in here. You'll have at least two people, but there's normally three people. This is a team effort. There's always someone who stays in the bell, and then you have the divers that go out of the bell to work. Divers are normally tethered with um, umbilical cord, let's just say, that provides the gas, all of that directly with it. It looks like Stan here is using some kind of rebreather device because there's no bubbles coming out, and he's walking on the bottom, which is not very realistic. We will be swimming, of course, as divers. You don't want to be walking on the bottom for a variety of reasons, not just destroying the environment, but also lifting up silt and all this dust that comes up and then you can't see anything. So what's the point of walking if you can't see where you're going? Very funny. And there she is, the moon. All right, so he's swimming now, not walking, which is great. Now the kicking that Stan is doing right now is called a flutter kick. It's the one that most people know about when you're diving with fins. Really helps the crushing anxiety, old man. However, when we go in overhead environments where there's silt, we actually do a modified kick called a frog kick which is designed to not stir up any silt. He has one light in the helmet. The lights that we use when we go cave diving or in overhead environments, we use lights that are super powerful and last a long time. This is my cave diving light, my primary cave diving light. It uses a canister battery. See, it looks like this. The battery is bigger than the light. This battery, for example, will last 24 hours in a lowest setting. If you run it in the highest setting, which is 4,000 lumen, it will go for uh, five hours. So even in the longest dive, we can run that thing at a high power, max power, and it will run just fine. Stan had lights in the helmet, which looked pretty tiny, not super powerful, but they seem to be running a wire behind the helmet. So that means that he probably has a pretty long battery. So now he's walking again, destroying the visibility in the silt. So definitely don't do that. Very inconvenient that he has to hit a button for every arm. It should be like a master button that just releases all the arms at once. He got into this submarine and submarines have uh, one atmosphere of pressure, meaning the pressure inside the submarine matches the atmospheric pressure on the surface. Atmosphere that covers the earth. That's the amount of pressure that we have when we are at sea level. When you're inside a submersible, that pressure matches what's at sea level, no matter how deep you are in the submersible. So you notice that he was diving, he's under pressure, and the pressure is counted as atmosphere. So at the surface, you're at one, and then every 10 meters or 33 feet, you add one. So two atmospheres are 33, three atmospheres are 66, and so on. So he was under the heavy effect of atmosphere, and then he just popped in a rover at one atmosphere, like it's no big deal. If you did this in real life, you would have been so bent and probably died from decompression sickness. So it's so what causes decompression sickness is bubbles growing inside of your systems and those bubbles getting lodged somewhere. They can get lodged in your brain. They can get lodged in your heart. They can get lodged in your spine and you become paralyzed. I mean, it's unpredictable. So because of that, we don't gamble with it. We just ascend slowly. And if you have decompression stops, we stop. You have to decompress before you can enter something that is depressurized. Uh, if he was really diving deep, it would have taken him probably hours. By the way, I don't blame him that he's using a submersible. Like swimming is tiring, especially if there's current. So the fact that he's going in a submersible, as you can see, is awesome. We actually use stuff like this in real life. Uh, they're called DPVs or diver propulsion vehicles. For sure, we call them scooters. So we typically say, are you diving a scooter today? And I actually have one here, see? So that propeller in the back, we just hang on to it, press this button right here, 
and then swim with it. Now, this one is tiny. The ones that we use in real life are much, much, much bigger, but it allows us to swim at 95 meters per minute. So that's almost as fast as an Olympic swimmer underwater. And you don't get tired. You just press a button and go. I wish I had one of these when I go diving. I dive a rebreather as well when I dive in caves. And one thing he's lacking is a bailout system. You can bail out to an open circuit, which is what people are more used to seeing in diving, which is with the bubbles, right? You breathe in and you breathe out and you see all the bubbles. So we actually carry one of those as a backup. That's only for emergencies, but that's something you would see if this was real rebreather dive, you would have a backup system. And fun fact, I've had to bail out for real twice inside of a cave before with a catastrophic rebreather failure. So we train for that. Thanks, Tim. No worries. See you inside. So here, as you can see, Stan actually enter into what we call an overhead environment, which is a cave, or it also can be the inside of a wreck or any structure. As long as you cannot go all the way to the surface, we consider that an overhead environment. Oh, he just did a frog kick, by the way, that was good. One of the rules that we follow as divers when we go inside a cave or an overhead environment is to always have a continuous guideline to the exit because that way you can follow the guideline on the way out if you get lost. And that's why a lot of people have died in caves and in wrecks because they go inside and then they get lost and cannot find their way out and they drown. We actually bring a guideline with us everywhere we go. It looks like this. This is a spool. The cord that we use inside of it is really high vis. And we actually roll this all the way from the open water environment where we can go straight to the surface if we need to. This one is pretty small. I just brought it as an example. But depending on the dive that we're doing, we will actually change the spool or the reel that we're bringing. Exploration reel. You see the size of that? That has one kilometer of line, so over 3,000 feet. If I'm gonna go into a cave that is super long or, or maybe I don't know how big it is, how long it is, I can bring a huge spool or huge reels to make sure that I can reel, I can have a line all the way to where I'm going and then I can exit safely into the open water even if I can't see where I'm going. We use these things called arrows and these go inside the line to point to the exit. See how it looks like an arrow? So that way, even if you're in zero visibility, when I'm going on the line and I hit the arrow, I will know just by feeling it that the exit is that way. We have all the markers called cookies. You will never ever go into an overhead environment without a guideline the way Stan is doing because well, it's very dangerous. You'll get lost and you'll die. More rubbish left here by unit trench. I found some exciting things. Yep, underwater pottery in Mayan cenotes that are pre-Columbian, so before Columbus came here. So really old stuff. But I went inside a cave in Missouri, and when I was coming out, I see this wedding ring just sitting there on the at the bottom of the cave, and I picked it up, and I still have it. So I I need to find the owner. You don't really get to see a whole lot of life in caves. I mean, there are some cave adapted animals. They look like shrimp, but they are translucent and they are blind because they live in a cave which is pitch black. There's absolutely no light. In the ocean, yes, all the time. And I love diving with especially big sharks and stuff like that. Those things are awesome underwater. I don't know what that resource is. It looks like algae as a resource. I'm not sure. Music tapes. That's a resource, I wish. I have music underwater. Somehow a seal is here. What's that seal doing? It's too deep for a seal. If this was a real seal, it would be like a puppy. It would be playing with him, following him around. Like seals are very, very playful underwater. But they get tired easily, by the way. They try to play with you, and if you don't pay attention to them for like five or 10 seconds, they're like, I forget, and they just leave. But if you engage with them, they'll play with you for hours. Oh, look, it's a leatherback turtle. Very realistic, by the way. They look like this. They're reptiles, they breathe air, but they sleep underwater. I've been in dives before where there's a turtle just sleeping underwater. I don't know how long they can sleep for, but it's pretty uh, interesting that you can fall asleep and not breathe in water and die. That's pretty cool. <laughs> there's a lot of living quarters underwater, I guess, in this game. Shut. There's not a whole lot of that in real life. You don't really see underwater living quarters. Uh, there's a couple in Florida. There's one called Jules Underwater Lodge, which is an actual hotel where you can stay at. And you can even get pizza delivered. There's also a lab 
and the Keys, which is a 50 feet underwater, and they do all kinds of studies down there. People live there. The way it works in commercial applications is that on the main vessel, everybody lives in the vessel, but the divers, the commercial divers, live in a system of pressurized quarters. That the pressure inside that chamber where they're living is equal to the pressure where they're working. So let's say they're working at 100 meters or 330 feet underwater, okay? So the pressure inside this chamber is 330 feet underwater. And they're breathing a mix of air that is not the air we breathe because the maximum operating depth of air is 218 feet. So that's barely 66 meters or so. So if you breathe air deeper than 218 feet, you can die. You can uh, suffer of hyperoxia. What they do is they breathe a mix of air called trimix in which helium is injected into the air. So you're breathing oxygen, nitrogen, and helium. So they have the perfect mix for the depth that they're diving. He would be breathing trimix and his voice would be like helium voice. It would sound like, you know, like a chipmunk or whatever. Death doesn't really have an effect in the human body outside of the cavities in your body that are filled with gas, like your sinuses and your ears. We learn how to do a process called equalization. You learn that very early, like the first class, they teach you how to deal with that because one of the things people are concerned about is pain in my ears. Like I go to the bottom of my pool and my ears hurt. How do I get over that? As long as you know how to equalize properly, the pressure doesn't feel different in your body, whether you're at 10 feet, 30 feet, or 300 feet. It feels exactly the same, which is pretty cool. I don't know what all commercial divers are doing out there. Everything I've seen is not as complex as this. It's typically like single task driven. Like we're gonna go and we're gonna weld this pipe or we're gonna find this thing. We're gonna unlatch this thing. You know, the missions that he's doing seem pretty intricate. What, what happened? There's oil. Oh, thank God. I thought we'd lost you. You get to see a, a bunch of stuff, and there are, you know, places, especially if you've been diving for a long time, where you get to see the effects over time. Coral that used to be thriving and full of color and fish all over the place now is, you know, grayed out and dead. One man's trash, another man's treasure. It's one of the things that I do in dives as well is pick up trash along the way. I bring in a mesh bag in my pocket and sometimes you find like beer cans from like the 70s down there. I mean, there's trash all over the place and you get to see the effects from humans in the ocean everywhere you go. So one of the advantages, I guess, of diving a rebreather like Stan is doing is that there's no bubbles and there's no noise. And sometimes when you're underwater, it feels so peaceful that you don't hear anything. And it gets to a point where, for me at least, I forget that I'm even underwater. Like I'm breathing so calmly, you're so isolated from everything that you kind of forget you're even breathing underwater. It's pretty awesome. That is something that is very realistic in this game that as he goes deeper, it gets darker and darker. That is legit. Every individual color from the sun gets stripped away the deeper that you go. And the deeper that you go, only the blues survive. First ones to go away are like reds and yellows and stuff. Because of that, I can tell kind of how deep he is everywhere in this video. You know, when you are really in deep ocean and you're by yourself, you look down and you see nothing. It just becomes black, right? It goes from blue to deep blue to dark. And then you look up and you sometimes don't see even the surface. So you feel very, very small, very, very isolated because there's nothing else near you except for your dive body. The things that they got right, they got really right. Like they did a really good job. Of course, the things that were not accurate, like the changes of pressure and, and things like that are more technical. I understand that if you make it 100% realistic, it's hard for the plot. Other than that, I thought it was pretty cool. And that was it. That was my take in Under the Waves and the realism around the game. Check out Dive Talk here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe to Experts React here on YouTube and Facebook. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Okay, so let's pause right here for a second. It's when he is inside and looking at the cave, right there. Okay, now oh, you were out. A little bit further back. Right there, right there is fine. Oh, you had it before.